And we're back, Stripe Show podcast on a Tuesday. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Thank you for making us part of your day, however you're tuning in, audio, however you're consuming the audio and the video, which is taken off on YouTube. My goodness, uh, our uh, listeners all over the place, audio and video, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, if you don't mind, go leave us a ranking. And a comment, it goes a long ways uh, in the way of uh, rankings. And those matter, folks. Those matter. We're trying to get to the top five. We're on our way in the studio here. The Today's Stripe Show podcast brought to you by About Golf. As you can see, beautiful simulator glowing in the backdrop. Uh, got some content that I'm going to be shooting later on this afternoon. As the studio, folks, is close. We're probably 85 90% there. A little more paint on the walls, the cabinets here, and uh, I think we're going to be good to go. I'm excited. I really am. I'm excited about the podcast. I'm excited about the studio um, and everything else that's uh, that's going on. And, you know, look, all of this talk in professional golf, we cover professional golf um, with the LIV. It's good for business. You know, whether you're a fan of the LIV or you're not, it's it's good for the podcast business. We feel like we've been right there with it, out in front, looking at it from all different angles. I am open-minded about LIV. I, I tip my cap to them, the things that uh, they've been able to accomplish to this point. Now, when you have endless budget and money to spend, it makes things a little bit easier. When you're trying to build a studio here and fill it up uh, 1,700 square feet with a limited budget, things get a little bit tighter. You know, I'd like to go ahead and just invest in all of this really expensive stuff and have people come in and do it for me but I have a budget and with LIV, it's like, yeah, just, you know, whatever he wants a few more million, just go ahead and sprinkle a few more million to him, and we'll just get him over. No big deal. Don't worry about it. We'll just, we'll make that up in a day of oil. A little bit different when you're, uh, when your budget is endless, but you got to tip your cap. They are doing some good things. Uh, Henrik Stenson wins their third event, Ben Mister there um, up in the Northeast, New Jersey, Donald Trump's facility. And now the list grows of winners on the LIV. Of course, Henrik Stenson struggling on the PGA Tour. I tweeted that he missed, I believe it was 11 of his last 14 cuts on the PGA Tour. And he goes over there. He lose his captaincy of the Ryder Cup, which I have been, I have stated my opinion. That is not good for the landscape of professional golf. Brian Urlacher and I talked about that on Friday. And uh, it joins uh, Charles Schwartzel, who wasn't exactly tearing it up on the PGA Tour, and Brandon Grace. I mean, those are your three winners so far on the LIV. And I think they've done a lot of great things to get it to where it is. I tip my cap to, you know, pull off these tournaments. I've had a number of people who have went to these tournaments on site reporting back. I'm sure they're going to continue to get better with the experience on site. Um, as they turn the wheels, as they have more tournaments, which they do coming up. And, um, you know, I think from a from a overall overarching perspective, and, and you look at their, I, I, I assume, business model, they're going to want to have some kind of revenue coming in at some point, or maybe this is just, let's just throw money and go. Let's just throw money and go, and let's just show the world that, you know, we have how much money we have, and we're a real player and we have real power uh, when it comes to the landscape of professional sports. And we're using golf as a vehicle to, to flex that power. We have money. We can put together a great team and go out there and be a real competitive or competitor uh, to the PGA Tour. So, you know, I, I think money is going to have to somewhat start coming back in. I mean, there's rumors now that they're going to take these teams and they're going to try sell off these teams for sponsorships. I'm sure they're working on a TV contract to at some point start getting some money in because the thousand tickets that they're selling per day, and, and don't make no mistake, they're, they're not selling a great deal of tickets here. Um, there's a little bit of money coming in, I would assume, from that, but that's not going to pay the bills when you're paying Phil Mickelson $200 million. You're paying DJ a hundred and what is it? 50 million. I'm surprised Bryson got more than Brooks. I'm surprised Brooks let himself go to the live when Bryson got more than him. 
a lot of money going out the door. And those are the big names. And, and I would say right now, as Greg Norman and his team sits around, they have to feel really good about what they're doing and what, and what they've been able to accomplish to this point with these tournaments. They have to feel really good about getting Bryson, getting Brooks, getting DJ, Patrick Reed, but I think their next step now is one of these guys has to win. You know, they have to win. They, they've got to be able to lead with some bigger names as far as winning. All due respect, Brandon Grace, who's won on the PGA Tour, Charles Schwartz are a Masters winner, and Henrik Stenson, who won the Open Championship. I get it, but that's not gonna that's not gonna get it done. That's not the most bang for your buck. DJ's got to win one of these. Bryson, Brooks, somebody. They've got to start getting some of these bigger names that they're paying for to the finish line, and I think uh, that'll happen eventually. We know these guys are great players. Although, you know, Brooks is not playing the best of golf. I think his his health uh, is, is, a, is a valid concern. Where's Bryson's head at with his entourage out there every single week uh, and working on a game? It sounds like he's continuing to work, but uh, I think he shot even par the last event. He hasn't been playing great golf this year, and DJ seems to be trending okay. Um, and I've got a lot of questions uh, for, for a lot of those players. And this week, joining me, Pete Cowan. I'm really excited about it. He'll be coming up on Thursday. Pete works with pretty much the entire professional golf landscape. <laughs> He's got so many players. He emailed me. Uh, let me pull up this email. Pete Cowan, you know, great teacher from Europe. Works with Henrik Stenson, long time. Can't wait to talk about Stenson's swing. Very unique. He works with Kepka. He works with Westwood, Danny Willett, Thomas Peters, Padraig Harrington playing great golf on PGA Tour champions, Darren Clark, Victor Perez, and others. I mean, there's just a, it's just a huge list of players. He doesn't do a lot of podcasts, so I feel very fortunate for him to come on. We're going to be looking at player swings, by the way. Don't miss that on Thursday. Wednesday, Froggy. He's back, folks, finally. Froggy, after a... Uh, two-and-a-half-month vacation. <laughs> I'm kidding. Froggy back with Davis Love the third on Wednesday, who's won the Wyndham Championship three times up in Greensboro. He is the President's Cup captain, which will be coming up in September. That's going to be a great interview. I'm really excited to listen to Davis Love the third talk about his game a little bit, but more importantly, the President's Cup and, uh, and what that means uh, as far as you know, DJ Bryson Brooks over to live, not eligible for the President's Cup. It's going to be really interesting to get uh, behind the scenes insight from Davis Love the third and where all this stuff is going. It's going to be fascinating. It really is. Before we bring in today's guest, and sorry about yesterday, Damon Hack, that was my fault. He'll be coming back this month for the playoffs. I love Damon Hack. I worked with him at Golf Channel. Yesterday was his anniversary, 10 years on Golf Channel. Congratulations to Damon Hack. And um, I had a uh, issue here in the studio that didn't allow me to get in front of you as I am today. Um, so that was my fault. So we'll bring Damon back um, later on into the playoffs because I love talking golf with Damon Hack. Congratulations, 10 years. Quick story with Damon. We actually started at the Golf Channel at pretty close, I think it was within the same week or so. And I was part-time, and of course, Damon was full-time. And I can remember like my second show ever, Damon and I were sitting there, and I think Kelly Tillman might have been in the chair as well. I can't remember. But, you know, one of the things about doing live television is that it, it really teaches you how to listen. And you have to listen to the people in front of you, Damon and Kelly, and if we have a guest, but you also have to be able to listen to yourself speak, and then you have to be listened to people in your ear, the producer. And it takes time to really learn how to do that. I'm not a great listener anyway. <laughs> um, so you have to, you know, you have to kind of, you know, really learn that craft. And, and I can remember we were talking about something, and Damon looked at me and he asked a question. And I was looking at Damon straight in the eye, and I didn't hear the question. I didn't hear one word he said. <laughs> and he knew I didn't hear the question. So it went silent. And you don't want silence on live television. And like the professional he is, he just picked it right back up and spun it a different way and just smoothed the whole thing over. And we go to break and my producer in my ear is like, hey, Travis, 
Um, I know a lot's going on right now as you learn this, but the next time Damon asks you a question, answer the damn question. <laughs> oh, Damon was a, is, is, is a pro, man. I love talking to him. We'll get him back here. Daniel Rappaport's coming back up next Monday as well as we do our monthly catch-up. Before we get to our today's guest, Ryan Noonan, and we break down all things Wyndham Championship. He's the sports betting manager at Betspurt and four for four for four football. I had him on uh, last month. He's great. We're going to be talking um, some golf with him, breaking it down. But before we do that, Tony Finau, my goodness, congratulations, Tony. He has learned how to put these things away and win. I think Tony Finau is getting a little bit tougher as a competitor. And I think this putter is starting to heat up. He's had a couple really good putting weeks. In particular, at the Rocket Mortgage, positive 4.5. Didn't putt great at the 3M Open, really positive 0.8. His ball striking has been very good. You go back to RBC Canada, he was second, positive 6.4 putting. Charles Schwab, fourth, positive 3.1. Tony Finau, I think, is figuring out some things with the putter. And it's cool to see. Uh, because if Tony Finau starts putting up positive 4, 5, 6, whatever in putting, he's going to roll off some wins. And, and again, you, you can see he's getting a little bit more comfortable under the gun. I, I give him credit. I've been critical of him down the stretch. Uh, his coach, Boyd Summerhays, who will be coming back on as well in August. Uh, we talked as Tony was stumbling down the stretch, continuing a year ago. We talked about it, and he was very transparent. And we agreed at the time that when Tony starts winning, Boyd, you're going to have to come back on and talk about the difference and what's happening here behind the scenes. And he's going to do that. I love Boyd Summerhays. His kids are fantastic players, um, and, and Tony Finau is playing some great golf. So I, I look forward to getting him on. Congratulations to Tony. Back-to-back -back wins. On the PGA Tour, as we look ahead, let's bring in Ryan Noonan and break down the Wyndham Championship. And joining me now, he's back for round two. Ryan Noonan, how you doing, man? I'm good, Travis. Thanks for having me, buddy. Appreciate it. You ready for some football? Man, so ready for football. This is a tough time of year. You're starting to like really transition, and you know, golf is always in the mind. It's it's actually a passion, so we won't be stopping the golf at Betsburts Golf. But uh, Betsburts is our parent company. They own four for four, and and football pays the bills and keeps the lights on. So we uh, definitely are turning turning our attention there, and uh, I can't wait. We're like what thirty something days away, and you know, golf on Saturday, and then come home and watch the football on Sunday. It's a good time of year. Yeah, it's funny. I had Brian Urlacher on Friday, and I told him I was I was expressing to him my passion for football, NFL football, and and I told him I said, "Look, I'm I'm a geek when it comes to NFL football. I love them. You know, Grand Pacific Northwest, big Seahawk fan, and um, and I said I love I think I love the NFL more than the PGA Tour, and, he, and like he couldn't believe it. I was like Brian, <laughs> like Brian, it's the most popular sport in the country by far." And uh, I said, I'm just one of those fanatics that watched you play and beat us all the time um, and continue this year. So it's funny. And, and he and he's the other way. He loves the PGA Tour more than football. He'd rather watch golf on TV. So it was it was interesting to, to debate with him on Friday, yeah. um, the LIV and, you know, because he's all in. He played in the Pro-Am and and even just today, you know, Ryan, and we'll start with this and then we'll get into the Wyndham. I said in the beginning here in the intro, I said, look, I, at the LIV, I, I tip my my cap to him. I don't agree with all of what's going on and what's behind it. It feels weird. Um, but you have to tip their cap. There are three tournaments in um, to, you know, what they've been able to accomplish to this point. They've attracted DJ. They've attracted Brooks. They've attracted Bryson. When you have endless money, it's a little easier to do that. But when you look at their winners, I think the downside right now, Brandon Grace, Charles Schwartzel, and now Henrik Stenson, that's not the most bang for the buck when you're putting out that much money. I think at some point, the next step is one of those big boys have to win, don't they? Yeah. So my, uh, my buddy and, and uh, you know, co-host on our betting show at Bet Sports Golf, Jeff Feinberg has made this point over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I could not agree more is that until the golf gets more relevant than the press conferences, than the news blurbs and the rumors around who's going and whatnot and all that entails live, um, it's going to be a problem if there's ever like a goal to be profitable and to actually get viewership and to get sponsorship. And I don't know, right. There's a lot of discussion. Is that even the goal or is it more just kind of the sports washing stuff that we've talked about from the jump? So like, we don't really know what the end goal is at a certain point, you would think a business entity has to be profitable. 
Um, there, I mean, if you're able to buy tickets for, you know, $5 this past weekend in New Jersey, like, I don't think that they're churning gates to be able to make a ton of profit. So like no. at some point it has to come from, from something. So right. yeah, I mean, they continue to, to make splashes, but again, I haven't really tuned in for more than five minutes. I don't feel like I'm missing anything by, you know, by doing so they'll continue to, to shoot their shot at the top of the board. They apparently want anyone who's donned a green jacket and I get it. They, I think that's their best inroad for kind of continuing to splinter off and, and force the PGA's hand in these, you know, events, especially the majors to make decisions around what they're going to allow their people to do. So it's going to be c- continued news cycle for, I imagine at least another solid year before we could figure out what's going to end up happening, but it's, it's definitely in the news cycle, but the golf is still not getting my attention. I think that's your point. No. And then you have this kind of stuff coming out. James Hahn, the player and Twitter, yeah. Um, last night, he says, quote, take a look at the new PGA Tour schedule and you understand why players are upset. Vegas to Japan, to South Carolina, to Bermuda, to Mexico. For the viewers, it's a flick of a remote. For us, it's a 20-hour travel day and tens of thousands of dollars in expenses. Yeah, that's exactly why all three of those guys left was because of the travel. And that's And that's where I get upset and my blood starts to boil is when a player justifies the move over to live for anything else other than money. money, And that was my point with Brian. I said, you can give me all this crap you want. I don't believe a word Brooks says. I don't believe a word Patrick Reese says. I don't. I said, because none of them are going without that guaranteed money up front. That's two, three, four times the amount they're going to make. So when I read this stuff, it's just, it's just garbage. You know, it's like, come on, man. Really? Totally agree. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I get it. Like if there's something that happens down the road and these the forces are have to merge and like the PGA has to come to the table or whatever, like, you know, DP world tour. And these guys had a shot to get the cash. They, they had to get the bag or it's going to dissipate. So I understand it a little bit, but to your point, like don't pretend it's anything other than that. We're <laughs> right. smart enough to understand. And you know, I, I think we can all sit here and say what we think we would do if presented with the opportunity. And I don't know that we would really know depending on what that number looks like. So these guys' responsibility is at the end of the day to their families and to themselves. Um, And, you know, I don't think we need to look at our, you know, golf pros to be the moral compass for our lives. You would like them to make better decisions at times. And I understand why some have been able to latch on and say, hey, I more so than money, I really value top level competition. And I grew up wanting to play at Sedgefield and I wanted to go and, uh, you know, I don't know, do people really dream of going to the FedEx cup. I don't know, but like, I, you, you mm-hmm. get my point. You want to play in the big events against the best fields. And uh, you know, some people that still speaks to them and others understand that, Hey, I have a short window to really capture the bag and I, I have to take this as a unique opportunity to do so. So I'm trying to stay fluent with my decisions here. Again, I, I love the PGA tour and I love that golf and I love this schedule and these fields and we're used to these tracks so I hope it all works out in the end. But again, well, right now, I just hope we don't get two AAA fields to bet on. Well, James Hahn has made the long trip to Greensboro. Uh, he's <laughs> in the he's in the field this week. Sedgefield Country Club, Wyndham Championship. The playoffs really for a lot of them start this week. You know, the ones that are on the bubble here to get in next week. And then we go a run of three tournaments uh, for the FedEx Cup. Hard to believe we're already here uh, in August. But, uh, you know, this is a tournament that's been around a while. Kisner, of course, uh, the defending champ, you know, he won this last year. Then everybody's head exploded. He needs to be on the Ryder Cup. I was like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes just a little bit. Jim Herman, 2020. uh, Poston, JT Poston, who just won recently, um, won back in 2019. Snedeker a couple times, 2018 and 17. Henrik Stenson. Missing 11 of 14 cuts, going over the live, getting himself a W1 here in 17, Siwoo in 16. And then I'm going to stop here. Davis Love the third, who's won it three times. He will be our guest tomorrow. Super stoked about that. Uh, Davis Love, the President's Cup captain. So much going on there behind the scenes. We're going to dig deep with Davis Love tomorrow. He's won it three times. You look at Sedgefield, give my audience some of the cliff notes here, some of the key stats you're looking at. Yes, this is our third street week of birdie fests, right? We're okay. going to have to get to right around 20. I think last year that six-man playoff, uh, which I, I had a Russell Hemley ticket, and Russell Hemley uh, just – I think he lost three strokes in the green on Sunday, missed a really short three-footer, I think, to make his way and make that a seven-man playoff. That was painful. 
So that was the first year that we hadn't had a score in the low 20s. Mm. So again, we've had obviously with what we've had at Detroit when we had in Minnesota, just these absolute birdie fests. So this is a Donald Ross track. This is we're going to kind of in the Donald Ross section of the schedule too, but they don't really play the same. Uh, this one kind of plays more similar to what we think about when we think of like um, Harbor Town. And mm-hmm. I think of, uh, you know, it's like a Pete Dye kind it's of a Pete feel. Dye track. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, you know, there's some similarities there. When you look at the leaderboard and guys have had success. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by the Pete Dye piece is that there's really not one particular golfer archetype that wins here. We you kind of listed there. We see yep. a lot of different skill set. The one thing that is mitigated for sure is distance off the tee. Kisner spoke about that. He loves spots like this where he feels like, hey, we're all kind of playing from the same range on the second shot. And I feel like those are the best spots for me to kind of still win out here on the tour. So we do have a, again, par 70, pretty short track. Everyone can reach the par five. So par four scoring becomes a massive piece here uh, mm. because we we have, I think, eight or nine of them that are within that 400 to 450 range. Very similar to what we saw a couple of weeks ago uh, at John Deere. As you mentioned, Poston, there was a, a big dispersion of those shots, and that's kind of why he did so well. Uh, so it makes sense for him to be kind of on the radar again. Um, but again, like, you can compete here. It, we see a lot more so than other places. I think course history matters here a little bit more too. It's not something that I will weigh very heavily, but when you see some of the guys, you mentioned the leaders, a lot of those other guys have, they've like repeated in top tens. Like Siwoo loves this place. You mentioned his win in 16, shot a 60 here. He's finished inside the top 10 uh, the last three times. We This is basically the Webb Simpson Open. Uh, Webb <laughs> just kind of rolls out of bed here. We know the narrative around naming his daughter, Wyndham and all those things. Like, he just kind of gets a top 10 regardless of his form here uh, since he won. So I think course history matters a little bit more this week. We have a little bit more danger in play than we did last week, whereas the birdie fest with no you know penal shots in play, whereas again in Minnesota we had a lot of water. So this is kind of in the middle of the road, but this feels more like where last week was a bomber's paradise. We kind of bring the field into play here, and it kind of brings in the Kisners of the world. See, this is where the tour doesn't get enough credit because this is a great golf course for a play-in type of tournament into the playoffs because to your point everybody's in play here you know everybody's kind of playing from that same range you're gonna you're gonna get a lot of shots from 150 to 175 yards um so it's this is where these little things at the pj tour i think have done with their schedule james hahn um you know that make a lot of sense in why this is where it is you mentioned webb he's won here Boy, it was a long time ago. I don't have it right in front of me, but it was, I would have to say, what, eight or nine, ten years ago, I think, yeah. when Webb won here. And then most recently, he's he's always in the top three, it feels like. Last five years, seventh, third, second, second, third. Fast Bermuda greens. I, I think that's something to note here. When I think of fast Bermuda greens, Billy Horschel kind of comes to mind. He's played well here. And I'm kind of stuck on Denny McCarthy. I want you to talk me off the ledge as we get into the odds here or support me because I've said all year, a win is coming for Denny McCarthy. A win is coming. <laughs> I tend to sometimes historically I'll bail, and then when I do, it happens. So maybe this is the week McCarthy gets to the finish line. But the odds opened up. There's Will, 12-1. to 1. Shane Lowry, 12. This is... DraftKings Sportsbook. You got to shop around, folks. There's all kinds of odds that are out there. Uh, but as we come on the air here on a Tuesday morning, Sung JM 14, Billy Horschel 14, Webb Simpson 20. Wow. Yeah. So you go up top there. Any interest? Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk, I'll talk Denny first. And I, I typically am not a Denny guy. And when we talk about, you know, trying to make betting cards and trying to add some statistical modeling and some things that I think can make sense to help make this this game of picking one out of 156 to win a little bit easier for us is I, just the things that are sticky statistically week in and week out. Uh, putting is not that, and that typically is Denny's bread and butter. And I know, and I do agree that I think you'll see some people talk about like we shouldn't include or wait putting at all. And I think that that's a mistake too, because I do think that there are guys like Denny, for instance, and, and like Billy Horschel that have a higher baseline skill set than the average guy. Now, there are certain times where we want spike putting weeks that guys that have the sticky stats where depending on the week, like we want, you know, typically approach game. And we talk about 
you know, the proximity ranges that we've talked about this week so far, where you have the 125 to 150 bucket and then 150 to 175, we're going to have a around 50% of the approach shots there. Like those things tend to be more sticky week in and week out and putting isn't. So then he is great at, uh, on and around the greens, but the, the rest of the game, again, the proximity ranges that we need this week, he's just not terrific. As good as he is putting, he doesn't give himself a ton of birdie looks week in and week out. I have him 108th in this field over the last 24 rounds over, uh, you know, giving himself birdie looks because he just, he just doesn't have it with the approach game. He's been playing better this year. You know, obviously I think exceeded everyone's expectations at Brookline, but especially at that number, um, I, I just don't have it in me this week. Again, he, he profiles well because the putting stuff is going to, is going to populate well. Um, but Billy Horschel, I'm very much into. Billy is not a guy. I've definitely been beat by Billy more than I've bet on him. It's just not a guy that I typically play over the years. But he's been really consistent. I think you can make a case, Travis, that outside of like that real heater in 18 where he, you know, he, the FedEx Cup and just played really well down the stretch. Like this is the best he's played mm-hmm. in his entire career, most consistent mm-hmm. golf he's played. Um, everything's kind of up a little bit. Approaches have been better. His accuracy off the tee matters this week too. We have to find greens. We have to position ourselves in the right spot to give that second shot a good look to give yourself opportunities. And we talked about the course history matting a little bit more here than other weeks. And he's played pretty well here over the last handful of years. So I took a piece of Billy at 20. Um, Like you said, there are 14s out there shop around there. I believe there are still some twenties this morning on Billy Horschel. Um, I typically don't like to go with the top of the board, but when we look at really what's happened over the last handful of months, <laughs> it's, it's nothing but the yeah. top of the board, except right. Billy at Memorial. Billy right. was 60. Other than that, it's been nothing but like 40 and shorter. So I went with Billy this week as my play at the, I guess you would call the kind of the tippity top of the board here. Yeah. I, I just like how he's playing. And again, back, you mentioned back in that like Southeast, that championship Bermuda grass, we've seen him do really well. Actually, no one in the last decade has won more events on Bermuda than Billy has in the yep. last decade. So that bodes well for him too. So he's my play at the top. Yeah, I agree. That's the one I have circled, Billy Horschel. Um, you know, that was a big win for him at the Memorial. And that was, was a staple win for him. And then on brand, he misses the cut at the U.S. Open the following <laughs> week, misses the cut at the Scottish. And then I think the 21st at the Open Championship had to feel pretty good to him. Billy, you know, look, he's won uh, a number of times on the PGA Tour. Uh, could be a bit of an underrated type of player. What holds him back is his major championship record. Um, he hasn't been real competitive there. So I, I was encouraged by the 21st at the Open. Fast Bermuda, Florida Gator, Greens. I I, I like Billy here. Um, up top there, I tend to agree in the way he's playing. I'll be surprised with Webb before we move on to this next tier, which as we start getting some odds here, I, I, I like some guys down here. Uh, I'm, I've been a little surprised with Webb. I think he's I think he's healthy. Um, I was texting with his caddy, Paul Tesori, and, you know, look, he had a nice, you know, PGA at 20th, 27th at the Schwab, kind of working himself back in. Then he missed a cut at the U.S. Open. Okay. 13th at the Travelers. We're back. But then missed cut at the John Deere, missed cut at the Open. Um, he's right there in the number 69th at the Rocket. <sighs> really? I mean, where's, where's Webb at? So this is a, this is a different Webb Simpson um, coming in. Certainly this year, um, no one's played this course better than he has. Um, So I'm going to probably stay off of him, circle barely at the top at 14. I mentioned McCarthy. He's at 30 as we get into these next round of odds. Adam Scott, 25. Could this be the week for Harold Marner? He's played weird. He's played well here in the past, 25 to 1. You mentioned Russell Henley earlier, 25. And Corey Connors make enough putts at 25. Siwoo Kim, has played very well here at 28 to one. You, I think the, I think the, the comp to uh, Pete Dye feel is accurate here. And C Wu has certainly taken advantage of that because we know C Wu can play those courses. And when you look at tournament history here for, for C Wu Kim, how about a second, third and fifth, the last three rounds, you're going to, you want to roll with that with C Wu again? You're a professional, Travis. We did not talk about this, but I mean, you cannot just like I had put it on the tee for me. Okay. Uh, more perfectly, Siwoo is the next play for me. I got Siwoo okay. at 33. I'd be comfortable still at 28. The form as well uh, is is nice. We like to see him coming in. He played nice the last two birdie fests that we just talked about. Uh, didn't finish strong necessarily last week, but you know, nice little I think another top 15 finish for him. But yeah, I mean, he's talked about this as his favorite golf course on tour. He loves yeah. playing here. 
And I think sometimes we need to listen to those things. And his success kind of backs it up too. Uh, as you mentioned, the, you know, three consecutive top fives, um, including making the playoff last year in that, that final group. So, yeah, I like the form. I, again, we sometimes have to buy into these narratives. And because this is a place that we've seen guys kind of repeat in the top 20 range and, you know, find themselves there in the mix on Sunday, I like Siwu quite a bit at his number at 33. So, I think, again, the, the correlation to the Pete Dye tracks makes a ton of sense. And we know that those are things that have bode well for him so far in his career. You think Kisner has been offered to go to the live? Yeah, I mean, Kisner, I don't know. That's not fair. But like Kisner, Scott, like those, a couple of those guys, they feel like they're, I think they feel like off. they would have been automatic, right? Yeah. And they just that's not mean like, like fair to Kisner. Like, because he's got like that mentality, like he's a hustler. We hear about like the, you know, yeah. The, the games he'll play, you know, they'll walk up and, and take your money. Yeah, he feels like a he feels like he would have taken the money, but I don't know. That's probably not fair to, to, to Kisner. Yeah, I don't I don't know if he has. I mean, I, I'm just speculating. Um, but he does feel like someone who would have jumped on it if the number yeah was right. And he's just been kind of treading water. You know, he had a little run of missed cuts there. What was it? One, two, three, he had five missed cuts early part of the summer. Um Sixth at the Travelers, 21st at the Open, missed the cut at Rocket. Now he's going back to a place that you like. You mentioned with Seawood. I think you do have to listen to those kinds of things um, if they do like this place. I, I like Seawood. That's certainly – we're kind of – we've got the same names here. And this wasn't planned, folks. We, we do so far have the same names, um, you know, circled. There's Zhu Young Kim at 30. I think Zayden Hutt's interesting at 30. Mm -hmm. And I think Terrell Hatton's interesting at 30. I'll stop there. If you had to pick one of those three, who would you pick? Yeah, the Tom Kim thing is interesting. He's this, yeah. this kid can play, right? Um, I mean, young kid, 19, is out here just, just dialing it up. It's getting short. Uh, then, you know, th these are short numbers here. But at the same time, yeah. like, um, you know, might be a finishing position bet for me versus a, a, an outright. But he would probably be my pick in there. I think, obviously, when we're just looking at class of player, you know, Hatton stands out in, in a, like a sore thumb because he's definitely, you know, we're looking at over the last handful of years as a top 20 player in the world. He's just, he's someone that I just didn't never hit um, in a spot where wedge game matters a lot. He, that's kind of where he, he shines. I just, we just haven't seen him a lot. He's been kind of a sporadic schedule back and forth. So um, I think you're just making that straight play on a number and uh, in class, I think he makes a ton of sense. He hasn't been really good. Um, off the tee, you're finding the fairways has been a little bit of a problem this year. He's been spraying it a little bit, and he hasn't been really good this year. Is he's been historically in the proximity range that I think matter this week too. So I just haven't seen it again. Kind of short recent form on Hatton, but again, like it's hard to think of you know taking Tom Kim at a shorter number than you know Terrell Hatton. So I get mm -hmm. just from a pure number standpoint, Hatton would probably be the play. I, I could flip the coin between Bazaden Hutton Hatton. Yeah. Um, I think you make good points on Hatton. Said in at 68 at the uh, Open. He was 16th at the Scottish Open, second at the John Deere. I can see Bezaden Hout getting fired up here with the putter, though. I can see him yeah. starting to, you know, that's that's uh, on Bermuda. He's very good. I could see Bezaden Hout. That's a name that I think I'm going to play. Yeah, he's been really good in these shorter par fours as well. Yeah. When you look at it, proximity ranges that we that we you know think matter. And as you mentioned, the putter, like, again, he's terrific consistently mm -hmm. with the putter. So, like, he deserves credit for that and as far as his overall skill set. So, you know, even these guys that are with a higher baseline than other guys, they could still have spike week, too. We, we talk about spike weeks from these guys that are, you know, great with the irons that are, you know, team no putt guys. Like, these terrific putters can have electric putting weeks as well. So, you know, Sebez makes a lot of sense. He's definitely on the card, probably from a finishing position standpoint or maybe matchups. Be a Kim top 20, keep the good play going for the 19 year old. Yep, uh, Bazette and Hutt, I'll play to win. Aaron Wise 40, Justin Rose 40, Taylor Pendrith. I talked about him uh, a decent amount last week. Um, I thought he was an interesting name coming in, yeah. and um, and and he and he panned out at 40 to one. Brian Harmon, I've, I've been hearing his name a decent amount this week as a good course fit at 40. I, I'll probably pass, but I've been hearing his name. Kisner at 40, Keith Mitchell at 40. Munoz is back at 45. I mean, is JT Poston getting a little disrespect here at 45, considering the win and recently the win, and then also he's won here? 
That feels like it's a pretty good number for Poston. I took another I shot think- in that range. I, I think you know, Travis, I am a sucker for Aaron Wise. Um, I do the Aaron Wise thing every week. There's no <laughs> shot that I can back out of Aaron Wise uh, in the last week of the regular season. Again, the last time we saw Aaron Wise really in the mix was in that final group on Sunday at Memorial with Billy Horschel. So and I think you did the show that week, if I wasn't mistaken. I definitely talked about Aaron Wise the week yeah. that we did the show for yeah. sure because it's I think you know, Memorial. Yeah, we we I just I can't stay away from the the, the skill set. I think he's the up and coming kid that that yep. does the things that matter really well. Um, this is a guy that struggles a little bit on the greens at times, so we need those spike week puttings. But at the same time, like it's getting a little bit better, and he deserves credit for that. Just mm-hmm. again, from an approach standpoint, from a you know proximity ranges that matter this week. Um, the putting actually from 10 to 15 has actually been markedly approved. The short putting has been a little bit of an issue. So I'm back on the Aaron Wise train at 40. Again, just want to continue to be long on that guy because again, like I don't want to chase live on, you know, Saturday afternoon when I didn't take the 40 pregame on him, it, just knowing that that's a guy that I'm always looking to bet. So Wise was my play uh, over posting in that range, but I think that they are both terrific plays. See, I think the incremental gains for guys that struggle with their putter is important. Yeah. And, and you saw it with Will Zalatoris. You saw some incremental gains. You saw it with Tony Finau mm-hmm. about three months ago, incremental gains. Because I think, you know, that that's important. Those guys need to see the ball go in the hole a little bit. And when they when it does, then they can they can kind of catch fire. It doesn't mean that they're one of the best putters in the PGA tour. It just means that they're getting better. And as they get better and that confidence grows, they can ride that, you know, that's, yeah. that's something they can ride. And I think we've seen it with Fina. I mean, he's incrementally gotten better. And I even think he made the comment he made, I think it was in his press conference, not this week, but last, he made the putt on, um, on the second hole and off he went, you know, he just, he just off he went. I, mean, I think actually, I think it was this week. It was a press conference. I get, I get them mixed up, but it, the point being is that you can sense the improvement from Fina. It's happening, and and then all of a sudden he starts making a couple putts early. We're off. Yep, off we go. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Your lag putting has been terrific for Fina in the last yeah. couple weeks. It's just been yeah. incredible. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Yep. And I think that's a that's a sign of improvement, right? Like yeah. their their touch, their the the contact off the face, the feel, the finesse, some of these intangibles coming together. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, um, you know, I, I think you make good points on, on, um, sorry, it's a little loud here. There, someone's like dragging this metal, I don't know, something down the hallway here. Anyway, um, I think your points on, on Aaron Wise are valid. I mean, he is a good ball striker, really good ball striker. Um, his short game is better than average. Mm-hmm. And I think there's some incremental gains there with this putter. You know, that long putter, like when he was in college uh, back at Oregon and staying with that, you, you, you've seen some good weeks. I mean, the second at the Memorial, he putted beautifully. Uh, 23rd at the PGA Championship, putted beautifully. He was 34th at the Open Championship. So it feels like a, it feels like one's coming. It does. With Aaron, he's he's trending the right way for sure. Um, can Pendrith keep it going? I think it'll be interesting. Kisner, I'll, I'll probably pass this year. Um, I tend to... I tend to do okay with Munoz. Um, he's someone I'll probably look at a little closer. Riley has Riley has kind of cooled off a little bit at 50 to 1. Davis Riley, same coach as, as Aaron Wise, works with Jeff Smith, I, I think has shown some games with his ball striking as well. Jason Day's in the field at 50. Adam Long at 60. Scott Stallings at 60. Is that do you, do you feel that's appropriate? <laughs> Dude, you're really good at this. Uh, I took St- Scott Stallings at 70. Uh, you got a 70. And, yep. Oh, but okay. I'm gonna take, I take 60. Like, okay. Look at how he's been playing. He's been terrific. Um, and wh- again, what matters this week, he's really good at. Um, this mm-hmm. is I was on him at the John Deere, I think, for the same reasons. Uh, I was on him last week uh, for the same reasons. Where he, they, the Again, he can find the fairway. He can set himself up. He's really good from the proximity ranges. And he's playing better golf. I think he's mm-hmm. just been better off the tee than he has been in years past. And um, yeah, 70, I think is just a bad number for him with his recent yep. form. So I was happy to, to click that again. Um, don't want to chase. Uh, I was on Pendrith last week, you know, had yep. that. That's all you want is to have a chance on Sunday with a guy like that. And you 
see the leaderboard around him, and it's like, oh, this, you know, let's see if this kid can hold up against the, you know, with Finau and Cantley and, and Cam Young creeping. And this just doesn't feel like a Pendrith course, whereas last week we knew there was a chance where it was just going to be set up for a bomber's paradise. The kid hits it a mile off the tee, and it played really well for him this week in a spot where that's advantage is a little mitigated. Um, I feel like the Scott Stallings of the world are, are more appropriate than, than Pendrith. So yeah, I think it's a bad number on And there. Like you said, you got to shop because there are forties on Scott Stallings. So oh wow, seventies you know, and sixties feel like a mistake. Four top tens in the last six events for Scott Stallings. And by the way, that run started when he came on the podcast. I'm just saying, mm. I'm just saying right when he came on the podcast is when Scott Stallings started going. Tend to have that effect on. Yeah, I mean, I Davis, if true. Davis Love wins this week, I man, if he's in the field, <laughs> I'm sure he is. Then, um, all right, something I mean, that's, here. Uh, yeah, that's uh, but you know, gosh, now we're starting to get into some of my names. Um, you know, you got Svenson at 70, <laughs> um, KH Lee at 70, Hubbard at 70. There's my boy Smalley at 80. <laughs> There's my boy Alex Smalley at 80. Bermuda, one of his better surfaces. I don't like him on bent. Get him on Bermuda. Missed a cut at the Rocket Mortgage. But man, Smalley 10th at the Scottish. That's a that's that's big time. Top 10 at the Scottish. That's big this time. Is, it's the last bet I've made okay. on the card. Okay. Is Alex Smalley at 80. Okay. Um, I'm betting it to them. I'm betting it. I'm betting yeah. It. yeah. All right, home course. Um, yep. you know, he, obviously, you know, I think this is in his backyard. He's grown up playing here. Um, pretty good last year. I think he was like a top 30 play. Um, and actually didn't really put it well, which is surprising. So yeah, I mean, again, it's a, I think it's a bad number. I'll obviously, you know, kind of straddle a little bit with a finishing position bet as well, but I think 80 is a nice number, you know, if, as far as some of the long shots, you mentioned some of the guys that I love too. Uh, Mark Hubbard. Yep. I was on Hubbard last week, missed the cut on the number, which was surprising. I think that form is really nice. We don't give a lot of credit, I think, to the alt field events because obviously we're focused on other stuff, but he played really well at Barbasol and Barracuda. Um, and then I think kind of this spot where everything kind of blends in, as we talked about, uh, Hubbard makes a lot of sense. Fence is a guy I've clicked many, many times. Again, he'll find his way on the card, not from an outright position, yeah. but a finishing position bets for sure. So those are some other names that I like quite a bit as well. Yeah, Svensson's like an automatic top 20 for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's, he's a talented kid. I mean, he really is. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to watch Adam Svensson into, uh, into the next year here and, uh, and see if he can, if he can continue to, to mature as he's seen the, as he's seen these golf courses now and, mm -hmm. uh, and take that next step. All right. Stop me. If there's a name that we got to look at got her up. I know people are pumping his name a little bit. I've certainly talked about him. He, we had him on the pod here a couple weeks ago and, you know, he's got to make some things happen here this week at 80. Uh, Johnny Vegas at 80. Cameron Champ, 80. Martin Laird, 90. Hmm. Aaron Rye. He's at 100 with Reevy. Nick Taylor, maybe? Nick Taylor could be a top 20 look, couldn't he? Potential. Nick Taylor's, yeah, Nick Taylor. Again, you're not going to find anything in form that makes a lot of sense, but you'll see 10th uh, last year. Yep. Um, eighth here a couple years prior to that. So he's obviously, again, this is a spot where we should consider Nick Taylor more than other events. Whereas some of the other guys you mentioned that I like and have been on recently, like you know, Cam Champ and, and Goddard Up. Again, we talk about the distance advantage that they have. And distance is always going to be an advantage, but like these guys can't go out and, and bang 360s here. No. He just doesn't set up for that. So again, that is their massive advantage week in and week out. And it's kind of, uh, you know, they got to keep the, the head cover on on a few holes here. So that kind of brings Nick Taylor's into play and maybe keeps the Chris Goddard ups and cam champs and Pendris off the card for me. So yeah, uh, you can sell me on a Nick Taylor. Same thing with like Vegas. Vegas is a guy that, you know, we think of he's playing a little bit better this year than, than just kind of bombing it out there. But um, we just haven't seen him a lot this this year. So maybe a first round leader bet. If that's your thing. Same thing with Munoz. That's a guy that I always love to get out in on, on Thursdays, but uh, not necessarily full round bets. I like Munoz, man. He, He's my kind of guy. Uh, Caleb Taron, you, you in on him? He's coming on next week. He'll be on the podcast next Wednesday. Big week for him. You, he's this 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 guy's playing some good golf right now. He's been playing really good golf. Yeah, I mean, same thing. I believe he's another kid that just has a massive advantage with distance too, right? So I think that that makes a little bit of a pause for me. But yeah, he's the trending form is is fairly solid. So which game's I'll, been good? Yeah, which game's been pretty good? Potting couple good. I mean, 
Look, I, I think I'll go Tarim. I, I could certainly convince myself of a Tarim top 20. I don't know if I'll play him to win here, to your point, and kind of, you know, uh, the driver maybe out of his hands a little bit more. But it, it, it's cool to see the complete game, though, too. I mean, his approach game is trending nicely. Um, his his short game is fine. His, his putter seems to be steadily improving as he goes on. I mean, he's an interesting player to me. I I don't know much about him, I'll be honest. Um, someone I've not met, but we're going to have he, – he agreed to come on next week. Big week for him, and look forward to getting to learn a little bit more about him as we get into Naismith at 100. Yeah, um, yeah, Neesmith. Uh, you mentioned, yeah. I think, Ches Reevy as well. Like, this yeah, feels Reavy's like that 100. should be these guys. Like, yeah. when you look at Reevy, is like back to back missed cuts here, um, 48th year the year before. He has a couple of top tens, but we're dialing back into like you know the early this is when Webb was winning back in like 2010. Um, so we just haven't seen it, but again, when you think of skill sets that play well here, like this is this is Reevy, like really good off mm-hmm. the tee, he's gonna find fairways, he's really good. I think actually top in the field on uh, the last 24 rounds from uh, 175 to 200. Like he's because he's a little shorter, he's going to leave himself around that 175 mark. Really still good from the 150 to 175 range too. So um, putting has been a problem for him of late, um, especially the 10 to 15 buckets has not been very good, but um, everything else makes a lot of sense here from an approach standpoint and finding fairways. It just does not have the course history that we would like. And I kind of am leaning on it a little bit more in terms of, of the card. So He''d be a look for me down, I think, if you're getting triple digits, but um, don't love it. I think I'm kind of done from an outright standpoint. Okay, so anything past that maybe to look at from a, I don't know, a top 20. Harris English is 130 to 1. Harris English, folks, Harris English has lost his swing, um, which is – just strange. Um, I can remember talking to his coach, JP Parsons, when they were putting it back together uh, last year and how well it was going. And now he's lost it. I mean, his, his, his ball striking is awful. And um, here he is 130 to one. Wow. I mean, just how thin of a line is it in professional golf? Harris English, another example uh, of that as we kind of get beyond now into the 110s, 120s, 130s, you know, some of the guys that I tend to gravitate to into some top 20s. Uh, I think, you know, this week for me, you know, Calum Tarum is definitely one of them um, that I'll, that I'll gravitate to Hayden Buckley. I think Hayden's playing, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Hayden Buckley's playing. I think that's one that I'll probably gravitate to. And then Vincent Whaley feels like he's turning things a little bit, potentially. Mm-hmm. Vincent Whaley um, could be another that I would that I would look to. Right now, he's coming in at 150 to 1. I mean, if you're an Aaron Wise guy, then you got to be a Patrick Rogers guy, don't you? I have lost a lot of money on Patrick <laughs> Rogers over the last, hand, like, five years. Um, yeah, I, and, but I've, I've been back on it this year a little bit, too. So, um, no <laughs> He's on the card. He's on the list. Yeah. I didn't give him the outright number, but um, yeah, he'll find his way in there somewhere. Definitely a, a definitely a Patrick Rogers guy for sure. So, um, Ricky yeah. Fowler, 130. He's got these. He's got this, these ropes on him hitting. Well, I mean, my goodness, Ricky. What's Fowler. he doing too? Right? Like, I didn't like. There's been so much live talk around Ricky, and here we are still. Like, I, I don't know. Like, well, I think now they're going to wait until after the tour champ. Um, but you know, there's going to be some more names, I'm sure, after the tour champ. I wouldn't be surprised if Ricky's one of them. Yeah, I mean, Ricky's lost his game. We know that. I mean, it's just, it's just not. It hasn't gotten any better. I mean, it just hasn't. Um, and you know, he feels like one that's going to go. A lot of, a lot of rumors around Cam Smith. Mm. You know, I mean, you start losing Cam Smith and Xander and Cantlay. I mean, I don't know if they're going, but you know, those are that's Tough. pretty significant. Yeah. A few of the guys down here that I think are worthy for finishing okay. position bet looks. Uh, Steven Yeager's been playing pretty good golf. Yeah. Um, and then I think from the things that matters, you know, fairways, proximity ranges that we need, just from an approach standpoint, overall, he's been he's been terrific. So he's down deep there. I think he makes some sense. Um, this feels like a you know, a Tyler Duncan course when you get these Tyler Duncan, Ryan Armor, uh, Ryan Moores of the world that they they're all the same dude for the most part. Uh, from like a skill set standpoint, they show up here fairly often. 
Uh, they make sense. Rory Sabatini just apparently loves this course. I haven't heard him say that, but I think it's proven in his track record here. He has never really carried much form in the year and then just finds himself in the mix fairly often. He's going to be getting you some plus numbers in the finishing market for sure. And then uh, I had one more. Oh, I'm going to give a little bit more of a look on it today. But Anibal Lahiri, again, we go back to obviously TBC Sawgrass and the Pete Dye stuff. I had a nice little run there. Um, kind of the things that we want to do well are the things that he does well, uh, things that we want here, he does well. So I'm going to take a little deeper dive on his form and see if there's anything there. But uh, Lahiri just kind of from a first look made the card. So I think Charlie Hoffman's finally starting to put some things back together. He too. is, yeah. It was good yeah. to see. Yeah, I think that's about as far as I'll go down. Um, I think he's at 200 right now. And, uh, hit, hit, you know, Hoffman kind of lost his swing there a little too. And I think his irons have come back, his driver – you know, now let's, let's catch fire with a putter. I, I think that's probably as far as I'll go down with a, you know, not an outright, but someone to make the cut. He was 10th yeah. last week at the Rocket Mortgage. I could see him, you know, continuing and doing the same thing here this week. So, all right. Interesting. This is a fun week. I've always liked the Wyndham Championship. I, I, I really have. I, I've always liked this tournament. It's a, it's a great golf course. I think it fits the mold perfectly going into the playoffs. Donald Ross with a... um you know, Pete die feel kind of thing. And I don't know. I, I just, it just, this one, this one hits home for me and let's hope we have a, have a good week. And, and geez, like you said, is this going to be another week where the chalk wins? I mean, could this be Will Zalatoris's first win? I made the statement earlier in the year. I said, Cam win, win, Cam Young wins before Will. Hmm. They've both been knocking. Yeah. They've both been knocking, but neither one of them has won yet. It might not be fair to Will, and I again, it's, it's really weird for me to not have him on the card because I've mm -hmm. you just I'm, I'm so again pot committed on Will. It just doesn't feel like, and this might not be fair, of a place that he'd win. I feel like he's going to win yeah. a, a super tough track against the mm -hmm. loaded field. Obviously, he can win anywhere if you can win those events, but like just a spot, especially where like long irons are going to be more important. I think that that bodes well for him, where that isn't necessarily the case here. So this doesn't feel like a Willy week. Um, Again, the number's really, really short. It's hard to be in that territory with taking a shot on Billy Ho and, uh, you know, Willie's not too, you know, far down the board there. But, yeah, it just doesn't feel like a Willie track. I think he's he's going to continue to knock, and uh, I think he's going to blow through the door next year. I think very easily we could see both Cam Young and Willie kind of have that Cam Smith and uh, Scotty Shuffler type of year where once they kind of pull the cork, it's just downhill, and they just, you know, start to steamroll. Get that confidence on a Sunday. See those putts go in and, and take it from there. Ryan, thank you so much, man. That was uh, that was fantastic. Ryan Noon, sports betting manager, bet spurts and four for four football. You've got a busy stretch coming up, man. So uh, don't be working too much. I, can't, I love it, man. It's, it's a, the best grind to have. I cannot complain. So the betspurtsgolf.com is a buck a month until okay. December. So if folks want to get over there. A premium content discord or they can get picks we got some tools over there break them poke holes in them we're already working on some new iterations of that we'd love to get you over there at bet spurts golf appreciate it buddy ryan noon we'll do it again soon thanks travis appreciate it buddy awesome